Can you hear it? Are you listening? God whispers to us. Can you hear him? Perhaps it is a feeling in our gut, a sudden insight, or a message that comes to us through his word. Or maybe it is the stillness of nature, or the blowing of the wind and the sound of waves crashing on the shore. Whatever form it takes, God is whispering to us now, inviting us to listen and respond. It is in these moments of quiet and stillness that we truly hear God's voice. And when we do, we have a choice to make. We can ignore it, dismiss it as just another thought or feeling, or we can embrace it and allow it to transform us from the inside out. God's whispers has the power to change us, to move us, to heal us. It can give us the strength and courage to face our fears, to overcome our doubts, and to take bold steps towards a brighter future. When we follow God's gentle whispers, it has the power to shake the world, to bring about positive change and make a difference in the lives of those around us. So can you hear it? God is whispering to you. Are you listening? Well, good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Well, we return again this morning to Matthew chapter uh, 5 through 7. This text is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the longest and fullest discourse that we have on record of Jesus' teaching. And so we've been kind of just uh, working our way through this whole sermon. And the first 12 verses are known as the Beatitudes. They're basically a roadmap of what it looks like and feels like to live a life of faith. And then in the sermon, Jesus then moves on to remind us that we are in the world, but we are not of this world, that we're called to be different. We are called to live differently, to be salt and light in this world, that we might be instruments that cause others to give glory to God. Jesus then talks about the law and the prophets. And for us, we need to understand that uh, Jesus has set us free and paid our sin debt in full through his blood shed on the cross. And because of that, we are uh, free from the bondage of sin and we have the ability to come into the presence of God, to know him in very real ways. But as Jesus is teaching here in Matthew, he's not yet become that redemption. He's not yet shed the blood that will set them free. And so he's talking to people who have only ever known the law and the prophets. That was uh, what the people knew of God. They couldn't know him in a personal way because of their sin. Their inability to fully obey the law kept them from fully experiencing and understanding God. And Jesus comes not to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. That every letter, every stroke of the pen, every word that God has ever spoken will come to pass. Jesus comes to fulfill the law, to set us free to know God and to be about the things of God without that bondage of sin always tripping us up and disqualifying us from God's best. Jesus came to make a way for us. And in this sermon, Jesus examines the law. He doesn't add anything to it. He simply begins to illustrate the depth and the strictness and the spiritual nature of the law. And they and we begin to get a greater picture of why it is we need a Savior. Jesus shows us, too, in the, uh, that sin is never just on the surface. That sin always goes deeper than it appears. It's never just about what happens on the outside. It's about what's going on on the inside, the deeper matters of the heart that reveal our sinful condition. And Jesus unfolds for us this very powerful truth here. And that truth is this, that what you look, on the out, what you look like on the outside does not determine who you are on the inside. That outwardly, you may look good and righteous, but your heart may be sinful and ugly and unsavory. And what's on the outside, will, what's on the inside will always work its way to the outside, but what's on the outside may never find its way to the inside. And we find out that Jesus isn't concerned so much about the outward mess. He's concerned about your heart, 
because that's where transformation takes place. And when God transforms your heart, your behaviors will follow. And so Jesus shows us that uh, things like murder and adultery, divorce, breaking your oath, seeking revenge, being prideful in your generosity, that these are manifestations of the heart far more often than they are just behaviors of the flesh. And when transformation takes place in your heart, your behaviors will begin to change also. So this really is revolutionary, grace-filled teaching that Jesus is bringing. And he knew that if they could just get a hold of it, if they could just understand it and embrace it, that it would change their lives. And you see, the very same thing is true for us today. If we can get a hold of this, if we can understand this, it will change our lives too. So what we're going to see today, Jesus, show us how this principle weaves through our praying and our fasting and our work and our worry. And so let's pick up where we left off in the scripture. Last week, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start out with uh, verses 5 through 18. Scripture says this. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be, uh, keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I just want to pause there and uh, kind of talk about this here. Uh, What we see is that Jesus is drawing us to the inward person. And who you are at the depths of your soul not only deals with sin, but also deals with righteousness. You see, as God transforms your heart, as you begin to change on the inside, as you begin to do the things that bring you closer to God, be mindful to do these things in such a way that it is not obvious to those around you, that it's not an outward uh, intention, but in in a quiet and steadfast manner, pursue God. And what God is doing, what he's working on in you on the inside will naturally become obvious on the outside. And you won't have to be intentional to make it obvious on the outside. And so uh, he says, when you pray, don't make it a point to pray publicly and try to demonstrate to others your spiritual experience. But instead, be more mindful and more intentional about praying to God in private and even in secret. Because God is more concerned about who you are when there is no one around for you to impress. More concerned about who you are when no one is looking at you. That's who you are in the depths of your soul. And that is the level where God most wants to meet you. So when you pray... uh, Don't make a big show of it. Don't be all like, okay, everybody, be quiet. I'm going to go in my prayer room now, and I need you guys not to disturb me. And if it's not your practice or your discipline to say a prayer of thanks before a meal, then then when you find yourself out to eat and you run into someone uh, from church or from another spiritual circle seated across from you at the restaurant, don't be like, okay, guys, we better say grace because people are watching us. Don't make it a point to pray in public if you don't first make it a point to pray in private. Yes? 
but seek for God to transform your heart. And as he transforms your heart, as his love begins to pour out of you, if in that process he puts it on your heart to lift up a prayer, to give him thanks for your meal, then pray. And as you do that more and more in private, when it's just you and God, then you will begin to do that more and more in public, even when you are in public, because it's just who you are and what you do. And you pray, uh, it's not that you pray because you are in public, but you pray uh, in spite of the fact that you are in public. Still, you will pray. You see, God is more concerned about who you are when no one is looking. And as you build up relationship with him in private, it will begin to show on the outside. Your life is never going to be transformed if your relationship to the things of God is only happening on the outside. If all you do is just go to church and say the right words and do the right things, that's just what we call behavior management. And it will not transform your life. But when you pray, that prayer life needs to start and it needs to grow in secret And as you pray, as you lift God up, God who is holy and sacred and worthy of praise, as you pray for God's will to be done in your life, as you pray for his provision to be evident, as you surrender to him and let go of the things that are separating you from God and from people, as you bring your temptations to him, your everyday walking around life and you lay it down at his feet in private, you will then become a living testimony to the goodness and the grace of God as the transformation that is going on inside of you then begins to spill out of you. And then your prayers will have power, both privately and publicly. Not because of your many words, but because of the depth of your spirit and your soul that is in tune with and surrendered to God. And then you will be more quick to forgive because you will have a sense of how much you have been forgiven. And when you fast, uh, don't draw attention to yourself. Don't go around looking like you're starving to death, right? Uh, Don't go walking around with this holy downtrodden state about you. Instead, make sure you look your best because uh, when you fast, it's about you and God. It is private and it is intimate and it's not anything that needs to be seen on the outside. It's about what's going on on the inside. That's what I see Jesus telling us there. Let's keep reading verses 19 through 24. Scripture says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So Jesus again here is, uh, he's focusing on what's going on inwardly. Don't, don't spend your days and your energy and the best there is of you chasing after external things of this world. They are outward treasures, and they're going to eventually break down and get outdated and lose their value and fade away to nothing. But instead, spend your days and your energy and the best there is of you chasing after the internal and eternal things. Things like relationships. Exhaust yourself to cultivate a legacy of love and compassion and mercy and joy and peace and kindness and gentleness and faith. Because these things won't break down. They won't become updated. They, outdated. They won't lose their value. They will not fade away. These are the treasures that will withstand the test of time. He says your eye, the eye of your heart, it determines, it, it determines what you look to and long for and chase after. And if inwardly your heart is not transformed, you will look only at the darkness and you will chase after things that bring you temporary satisfaction. 
But those things will always leave you longing for and wanting for and needing for more. Those are temporary pleasures. Uh, they are temporary escapes, and you're going to want more and more of them. But eventually, you're always going to fall back to reality, and you will never be fully fulfilled or content or at peace. But if inwardly your heart is transforming, then you will look at the light and you will chase after the things that bring lasting satisfaction and goodness and pleasure. And you will be an instrument of light that causes others to give glory to God. And you will have peace and contentment. He says you can't serve two masters. Your affection and attention will always be divided. Two masters will never be perfectly in agreement and alignment. There will always be some place, some point of disagreement and division. And there are times uh, when the things that you are chasing after, the things that you are giving allegiance to, are directly opposed to one another, like light and darkness, like the things of God and the things of the world, like God and money, like feelings and longings for things that are godly and feelings and longings for things that are fleshy. And you can't serve two masters. You will either come to a place where you love one and hate the other, and it won't always be the same thing that you love and the same thing that you hate, because if that was the way it was, well, it would be easy to determine which one you're more dedicated to, right? But it's more like a, uh, it's like a love-hate relationship. Sometimes I love this one, but at times I really hate it, and I love the other one instead. There will always be this struggle, and it will create a conflict inside of you that keeps your heart and your life in chaos. And eventually, you will have to make a choice. And if you don't do so intentionally, then eventually a choice will be made for you through the consequences of your actions. And really, in a nutshell, it boils down to the choice uh, between having God's way in your life or having your way in your life. Well, let's keep reading verses 25 through, 40 through 34. Scripture says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. That's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself, and each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, that's a big amen on that. Drop the mic, right? <laughs> so he starts here. Uh, he says, therefore. Now, remember, every time uh, you see a therefore in Scripture, you want to say to yourself, what is that? Therefore. Uh, it's there because what comes next will build off what you just read. So, therefore, because it's more about the inward and not about the outward, because the external things of this world will always pass away and leave you empty, because it's not through the outward that God does his most profound works, therefore, stop worrying about, stop chasing after those things. Your life is not made up of what is on the outward, so stop worrying about all of that. For it is the pagans, it is those who do not know God who chase after these things, and they are never fully satisfied. But you, if you seek first the kingdom of God, if you look after the inward condition of your heart, if you will chase after the things of God and invite him to transform your heart, you will not need to worry about your outward existence because God knows that you need clothes and food and all the little extra things that bring comfort and care. And if we will focus on the inward, he will provide for the outward. And as he transforms your heart, he will also transform your life. 
He, he will work in you, and that work will begin to come out of you. And as it does, his favor and his provision and his blessing will flow. And that will flow so much so that you will have people chasing you down to bless you. <laughs> because as God works in their hearts, it comes out of them too, and it spills out on you, and you get blessed. And then God gives you the opportunity to bless others, and it pours out of you, and you find yourself chasing after people that God has put in your path and in your life so that you can bless them. And, and it goes on and on, over and over and over again, but it all begins inwardly in our hearts not outwardly in our actions our actions are manifestations of our hearts and when Jesus transforms your heart your actions will follow and before you know it your life has been transformed that God may be glorified by you and in you and through you and what fills you is what will spill out of you when someone bumps into you. So church, may you do the hard work of knowing and seeking and loving God in private where he does his most profound and amazing things and may the outward manifestations of your heart bring glory and honor and joy to God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you and praise you for this day, for the opportunity that you give us to come into this fellowship of faith, the opportunity that you give us to come around your word. God, every time we come to your word, it's like taking a, 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 a big full glass of cool water on a hot day. Your word always quenches, your word always challenges, your word always brings us life. God, I pray that you would just um, speak to each and every one of us this morning, that you would help us to see uh, what it is that you particularly want to speak to us in the midst of this message, uh, that you would uh, just help each and every one of us to chase after you and you alone, that you would give us the courage that we need to open up our hands and give it all to you, knowing that you alone can provide for and care for and, and be everything to us, that we don't have to uh, labor and toil and spin like the world does but that you will bless the work of our hands, you will bless the meditations of our heart, you will bless our lives if we will just follow hard after you. God, I pray that you would help us to do that more and more every day. And as we do that, I pray that your, um, that your presence in our hearts and in our lives would be evident to those around us, that when they see us, they see the light of Jesus. Uh, in, our, in our hearts, in our eyes, in our lives. God, we just want to give you glory. We just want to be about your business. We just want to help other people come to know the reality of who you are for themselves. God, we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know what the Lord is speaking to you today through this message, but your invitation is to identify what next steps he might be calling you to take. Maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's information, maybe it's something that he's kind of been speaking to you, nagging at your heart, poking at your heart for a while, but you've pushed back against it. And maybe today's the day you say, I'm going to stop pushing and I'm going to begin to embrace that thing that God has put uh, in front of me in my path. Whatever it is, is your next step in your faith journey. We'd be honored if you would connect to us, if we can be uh, some assistance in that with you at all. We'd love to walk with you, to talk with you, to pray with you, to do life with you, that together we might grow closer and closer to Jesus.